Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for being here tonight. Uh, my name is Tony Payan. I am the director of the Mexico Center here at Rice University's Baker Institute. I want to welcome you to this great hall here in the building of the Institute. It is truly an impressive place, one just right to discuss the issue that brings us together tonight. Six years ago this month, I was sitting in my office at the University of Texas when I got a phone call. On the line was a dear friend and colleague, Erika de la Garza, who leads the Latin America Initiative here at the Baker Institute. Erika told me that a foundation in Houston had generously provided funding for a major study on immigration. She then asked me to consider taking a semester off and coming from El Paso to Houston to conduct a major study on immigration. That's six years ago. <laughs> By June 2012, I was here at the Baker Institute, putting together a team of truly brilliant scholars on the issue of immigration, political scientists, economists, lawyers, and on and on. That major six to eight month project produced a book titled Undecided Nation, Political Gridlock and the Immigration Crisis, six years ago. From there, we went on to found the Mexico Center, a unit of the Baker Institute that has spent much time thinking through immigration issues and delivering public policy recommendations that we still believe are sound and good for the country. In 2014, we almost saw the light when the Senate passed a bill that looked very promising. Then came 2016, a more toxic environment and a massive effort to cut off not only those living without documents among us, but also those who might come to the country legally. Thus, six years later, since we first addressed the issue of immigration here, since I first came here, the topic is still on the table. And unfortunately, few things have changed. A few things have changed for the worst. Congress continues to be gridlocked. We just saw it with DACA. Unable to agree on just about anything related to immigration. And we do now have a White House much more hostile to immigrants and raising the heat on the issue. Simultaneously, and fortunately, Americans continue to demand that immigration be dealt with in a way that is fair to the country, to the law, to the economy, and to immigrants themselves. Most Americans, every poll shows, remain hopeful that a reasonable middle-of-the-road solution can be found. Even so, it is truly remarkable that in spite of the fact that most Americans are fair-minded and rational, our politicians and many different then-fringe and now more mainstream groups have impeded a rational debate on this important topic in the country. I wanted to share this story with you for two reasons. First, to let you know that this issue has been at the heart of the Mexico Center's research agenda from the very beginning of its inception in 2012. We have dedicated countless hours and many papers as well as several forums and public debates to this very subject. And second, sometimes in the darkest hour, the sun shines through. So we will not give up and we will continue to find a way to research the subject and push for practical, reasonable public policy solutions to this issue. We strongly believe in the value of immigration and we strongly believe that even in the darkest moments, like these months, there is much room for dialogue, for debate, debate for enlightenment and for agreement. If we can find that sweet spot, that sweet spot that tonight we call the rational middle. Having said that, let me welcome to the podium a colleague and a friend of the Mexico Center, someone who understands the importance of immigration for our city and our state, 
Mr. Brett Perlman, who was recently appointed to the director of the Center for Houston Future, and he will then introduce our main speaker tonight. Welcome to the Baker Institute. Well, well, thank all of you for coming. This is an amazing crowd. I want to tell you a little bit about what we do uh, at the Center for Houston's Future. Uh, we are working on solving the region's toughest problems by engaging diverse leaders, uh, providing impactful research, and defining actionable strategies. And so currently, we're working on three issues. We're working on what we're calling business rejuvenation, where do we go in our economy in Houston uh, in an area where oil and gas may not be uh, as much a driver as it has been in the past? Uh, we're working on infrastructure resiliency. What are the issues post-Harvey that we need to deal with both in the physical infrastructure and in terms of attracting new talent to come to Houston uh, with the, uh, in a post-flooding environment? And thirdly, we're working on the topic today on inclusivity and immigration. And this was a topic that was um, suggested by uh, our board of directors, encouraged by Stan Merrick, who I'll introduce in a second, as an area for focus of the center. And through Stan's support, uh, he has uh, supported a set of videos, which you'll see tonight, on which encourage a, deba a debate called the Rational Middle as an important research for, resource for expanding the conversation on immigration. So we at the center hope to continue to amplify and expand the conversation on immigration to seek a consensus on immigration policy. And because of that, we're very thrilled to partner with the Baker Institute on this event. And I'm thrilled to introduce uh, my friend and colleague, Stan Merrick. Now you have to know a few things about Stan. Stan is a native Texan. Uh, he's a Marine, and most importantly, he's an Aggie. But we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll give him a pass here at the, at the Baker Institute at Rice. Uh, I've known Stan really for many years. I was introduced to Stan uh, as a very young man when he and my dad worked together uh, in the construction industry. And now he is president and CEO of the Merrick family of companies, one of the largest interior contractors in the Southwest. As many of you know, Stan's focus in recent years has been on compre comprehensive immigration reform. He's the co-founder of Texans for a Sensible Immigration Policy and a member of the Greater Houston Partnerships Task Force, Americans for Immigration Reform. Stan, uh, why don't you come to the podium? Thank you, Brett, and good evening. I thought I was on the panel. I didn't know I'd get to make a few remarks. I've got a few remarks. I've always got remarks about immigration. For, first of all, what, what we do is, you know, I'm an employer. Everything you see here, my team of immigrants built. 85% of the construction industry, 85% of the construction industry in Texas are immigrants. Half are undocumented. Not because they want to be, but because, as Charles will tell you, they've never had an opportunity for legal status and since before, after 1986. It's broken. So I'm really excited about this approach, social media, the rational middle. I personally have been involved in this because I've had ICE audits where we've lost employees that have been with us 10 or 15 years, and we have an ICE audit. The workers aren't deported. They just go to work for somebody down the street for less money and for no benefits. I have 60 TPS employees at the moment, temporary protected status, Costa Rica, Honduras. Most of them have been with me over 15 years. Many of them just worked on building the dome on the Annunciation Cathedral. Some of you may be Greeks in here. We need these people. And Houston has only about 600,000 undocumented. Put it in perspective. Last time you were in NRG Stadium, you saw 60,000 people. Fill it 10 times. That's how many undocumented we have in the city. The city is in crisis. We had this thing called Harvey, a hurricane. The construction industry, of which I've been in all my life, we were begging for labor before the storm. We couldn't find enough people. 
to build what needed to be built. And since a storm has happened, guess what? It's only worse. And then because of action in our state legislature, Senate Bill 4, show me your papers, the anti-immigrant sentiments that we hear every day on the radio, on the TV, many immigrants, documented as well as undocumented, have left the city for greener pastures. They're not coming across the border. They're, the border's pretty secure. And guess what? It's really hard to get our kids getting out of high school to come into the trades. And guys like me, us baby boomers, we're rolling out 10,000 a day of the construction force. So guess what? Six months, six years, we're not gonna have any workers. And what's that gonna do to Houston when people in California start telling their, their companies that wanna relocate to Texas, don't go to Texas, they don't have any labor. What's gonna happen? It's gonna kill us. The first thing we have to do is solve the immigration mess. And my, the easiest solution, ID and tax. Anybody that's been here five years, that can pass a background check, be put into e-verification, go to work for an employer who pays and matches taxes, just like he were a visa worker, that would fix it. That would fix it, it's so easy. I've talked to senators, I've talked to congressmen, I've talked to presidents. And they say, hey, that's a great idea, why don't we do it? Good question, good question. So when I met Gregory through Lauren Steffi, he had a novel approach. He'd just finished a series on energy for Marvin Odom at Shell that really changed the attitudes about fracking. And Lauren and Gregory came to me and said, Stan, we got that one solved. We need to go after immigration. And I was a little skeptical at first, but after I met Gregory and with Lauren's urging, I said, you know, this guy knows what he's doing, but more importantly, he's passionate. The more he learns about immigration, the more he learns about the, the, the terrible things that are going on in our community, the more passionate he becomes. These first three, you're gonna see two and three, I believe today, one and three, one and three, are, are, are really good. And yes, you know, we had to sort of seed them to get the ball rolling, but we hope to do maybe 10, maybe 20 of these. And we can always use more funding. So if you are so inclined, please contact me after this event. I'll certainly tell you how you can help us. But, uh, and I'm, I'm, Brett, I really appreciate the uh, Center for Houston's Future stepping up and sponsoring this. I think Bob Harvey said it best, you know, this is a business issue. Because if we don't have people to clean our buildings, to mow our lawns, to cook our food, to build our buildings, we can't exist as a city. We can't be the fourth largest nation, uh, city in the nation, like Steve's gonna talk about in this video, without those workers. And that's a lot of people. So I appreciate you showing up tonight. I appreciate your enthusiasm about this topic, which is so critical for our community. And not just because I need workers, but because you know our schools need to let the parents come and be with their kids. Our law enforcement needs to know who they stop when they stop someone or arrest someone. And our hospital systems. You know, our ERs are primary care for 600,000 people. That is not gonna work long term. So please help us spread the word, spread these videos via social media to the world. Number one has already had 197,000 viewings in two months. That's getting the word out. And I'm just really proud of Gregor. Gregor, where are you? Gregor, are you here? Come on up, Gregory. Now that I've given you that introduction, it's like putting a, you know, $100 saddle on a $50 horse, huh? <laughs> yeah. Thank you, man. All yours. Yes. Thank you, Stan Merrick. Give Stan a big hand. He's really an amazing dude. Um, so before I get started by a show of hands, um, if you are an immigrant or a child of an immigrant, could you raise your hand, please? Okay. So you guys know this isn't the rodeo, right? Because that's, that's going on too, I've been told. And this is going to be a screening about immigration films. Head to the back if you are somebody who would rather watch a Bucky and Bronco. Um, so tonight, one of my big goals is to remove the quotes around rational middle this kind of 
quote-y thing. We don't we don't do that a lot. Um, so I'm, I'm sorry. I'm gonna show you what what I'm gonna show you what 50 looks like. Here, hang on for a second. Sorry. Um, so first, I want to um, thank the people who have made this possible. Um, it, this is the beginning of a process. As Stan said, we are just now rolling. We've, we've released our first three episodes, but I want to first um, thank, and please hold your applause to the end because these people are awesome and they deserve applause, but Lisa and Tony and the staff here at the Baker, Kevin, who helped on the uh, tech stuff from the Baker Institute, uh, Center for Houston's Future, that's Brett Perlman, Betsy, and Stephen. They've been awesome to us. Um, and Team Rational Metal, this is really um, the group that really works as hard as anybody I've ever worked with in my life because they are as passionate as I am about this issue and want to move this forward. And they're right over there. So that's uh, Wendell Riley. Wave, Wendell. Wend Wendell's actually from Trinidad, and he is a permanent resident here, and he has a great story to tell if you want to hear it afterwards. Um, and then uh, Chris Lyon. Waving, yes, good. And then uh, Zach in the back, and then Amy Callahan is back in Shreveport, Louisiana, at um, at Rational Metal Central. Um, so now give them a big hand because they've all done so much to get us here. Um, as Stan said. The Rational Middle was sort of born out of a documentary that I did called Haynesville about a natural gas boom. And the, the film was specifically made to be a film that really didn't pick one side or the other. It really did sort of pick sort of this middle ground that really was the way that journalism and documentary filmmaking used to be. Um, but what was interesting about that film was that we saw people from both sides come to a place where they were willing to have a civil solutions-based discussion. Um, I met Marvin Odom at the Aspen Ideas Fest. He offered us the opportunity to really take it to the next level. And one of the things I saw was that people were having arguments inside the screenings for Haynesville about energy and they knew nothing about it. So to me, what I wanted to do was take the energy issue, create short films around it, distribute it for free online, and let people utilize those films however they wanted, whether they were sharing it amongst each other, they were doing ton holes like this. Um, however they wanted to do it, I wanted to give them that information and those tools to actually have that, that sensible conversation. To date, and keep in mind, these are not you know little kittens playing on a piano. These are energy films, pretty thick with information. The films have been seen and or downloaded six million times. They have spawned policy. They've spawned conversation. They played in the community meeting, the board meeting, and the policy meeting. And that is really what our aim is to do with the rash metal of immigration. Um, I have to say that um, Stan told a great story about how the rash metal immigration was was born, but it's wrong. Um, the real story behind it was that the, the passionate one was Stan. And when Lauren called me to see if I wanted to bring the rash metal to immigration, the first two words I said was hell and no. And the reason is, is because it's the third rail, right? It is a place where how can you find a middle where there's such divisiveness and such tension? There's so much sort of anti and so little pro. It, moving the needle was going to be very difficult. And then I met Stan. And Stan and his passion is really what drove us to wanting to take our concept and put it over immigration. And as Stan said, you know, the first three episodes have been released. Um, we're looking at over, you know, I, now I'm glad I have updated numbers, but 197,000 just on, you know, I think it's now over about around a quarter of a million views. These things are being shared and seen all over the country because someone has to give a voice to those who don't have a voice. There are people out there that are so afraid to speak because the people on that other side of the issue, on the anti side of the issue, are so adamant that they're right about everything that they think. And the problem is, is that the facts that they give are wrong and the arguments they give are wrong. Now, that doesn't mean that, that everything on the pro side is correct, and that's what we're exploring with these episodes. So the question is, what can you do in the audience, right? So uh, number one, uh, you can go to rationalmiddle.com. 
um, and you can see the films and you can view the films. Um, we urge you to help us find screening partners like this. We're, we're starting to line up a hell of a summer. If there's anybody here who wants us to show the films uh, in Hawaii, we're really anxious to talk to you. <laughs> okay, no one raised their hand. Um, so we, we're very excited about that. Um, the other thing is, is, as Stan says, we're looking for partners to help us continue the work in production, in the touring aspect of it. I think an important mission that we have is to take this not to the places like Houston where they understand what diversity is and they understand what different colored faces are or what accents mean, but to the places that are the smaller towns or the medium-sized towns or the Midwest towns that don't necessarily understand the immigration issue. Because ultimately, our aim is to give voice to everyone and for them to activate and create a solution. And you know, you might think that you're looking at the guy in the movie Fitzcarraldo, and I'm trying to take this opera to the Amazonian natives, but I saw this happen with energy, and I know that it can happen with immigration. So let me just tell you how it's going to go down tonight. So um, we're going to show two films back to back. Uh, the first film is called The Immigrant's Promise. The second film is a premiere that we're doing. It's called um, Immigration's Crossroads, Rebuilding After Hurricane Harvey, which should mean a lot to the people in this room. But keep in mind, as you're seeing, especially the third episode of the second film we'll see tonight, that this is an analog for the nation. You know, when you look at Houston and you look at the fourth largest city in our country, hobbled by 300,000 people put out of their homes because of a storm, that is an economic issue. That's not heartfelt. That's not emotional. That is a pure economic issue. And that's what we aim to do with the Rational Middle. That's what we aim to tonight. Lauren Steffi, our wonderful executive producer, is going to be leading a fantastic discussion. So thank you so much. Give yourself a hand for being here, please. Um, I'm sorry, you're going to have to give yourself a better hand or we're not going to start the film. Seriously, give yourself a yes. Awesome. Thank you so much. Have a great time. We'll be around tonight to hang out and talk more about the series. Viva la Rational Mission. someone born in another country with citizenship in another country who wants to come to the United States to pursue their dreams. We are a nation of immigrants, except for Native Americans. We've all come here from somewhere. People coming here to make a better life for themselves and to be part of the American experience are what built this country. They come to join family. They come to work. They come for opportunity. They come because they believe in the American dream. There's an interesting relationship between what our country needs and what immigrants give to our country. This is the first nation in the history of the world that can say we are a free people and we come from everywhere. Early history, it was overwhelmingly uh, from European nations. They came because of religious persecution, the pilgrims. Uh, they came because of famine, the Irish, the potato famine, and so forth. The United States has been seen as a land of opportunity. Not that they knew what the opportunity was, it was just going to be a different place and they could build their own life. Up till the 1870s, the United States had really no immigration system. It was kind of whoever got here was here. And that took us from the days of Columbus through the Industrial Revolution. For the best part of America, we were trying to fill up this continent, manifest destiny. We were doing everything to encourage immigration. After the 1870s, you saw efforts to really curtail and control immigration so that it was only limited, frankly, to Western European countries. It was not until 1924 that we had our first permanent quotas. The quotas were imposed based upon the national origin system so we would get the right kind of immigrants. 
But when Congress imposed quotas, they cut off virtually all avenues for people to come legally. Now, this is the problem. If you think about it, we had huge barriers from most countries. We had the Atlantic Ocean, we had the Pacific Ocean. Latin America, we have adjoining land borders and people could literally walk in here. We had uh, literally centuries of what we call circular immigration. People would come from Latin America, overwhelmingly from Mexico, to work. They'd work and go home, they'd work and go home. These immigrants came in because there was a job magnet here in the United States. There was a need to fill a lower skilled or lesser skilled service jobs. Starting in the mid 70s, we started increasing enforcement. People that would come back and forth and normally work within 100 miles of the border, they did something quite logical. Instead of going home and seeing my family on the weekends, I'll smuggle them in on a one-time basis. And that began to create this phenomena that has entered into our political debate of large-scale illegal immigration. Being a nation of immigrants isn't just a key component to our culture. It's been a key driver in creating the world's most powerful economy, the world's most dynamic economy. Immigrants supplement our workforce as landscapers, construction workers, service workers, hospitality workers. Although they may not have a lot of formal education, many of them come with skills and abilities that really contribute to these industries. Immigrants actually fuel the economy. You can't get the three or four or five percent growth in GDP without immigrant workers. And, you know, I, I find that to be kind of missing from the whole argument here that, you know, if you want to grow and you want to increase and expand U.S. businesses in the United States, you've got to have people to do the work. On the other side of things, immigrants bring creativity and they bring building businesses, starting businesses. About half of the dot-com companies that we have in this country were created either by immigrants or children of immigrants. I mean, these are big companies that are having a major footprint on the nation's economy. But then when you get down below that, you see approximately 28% of small businesses have been founded by immigrants. So the economic impact of immigration is not just your Fortune 500 company. It's a small business on the corner who is creating jobs for American workers and their families that they're going to every day. That's the beauty of America. That's what I think makes America strong. It's essentially a concept of fairness based upon what a person can do as opposed to who a person is. That's what makes people come here. But this is a great paradox, I think, that we cannot think of the United States as anything else but a nation that migrants come to inject vitality, inject dynamism, uh, creativity, talent, and then uh, become part of the society. That immigrant who left any of a number of countries around the world uh, to come to the United States to pursue their dream, they do that because they believe in the idea of America. The question is, do Americans still believe in the idea of America as a nation of immigrants? We are seeing not just the tension that comes with this question, but I think a tipping point for the country. Our immigration system is stuck in the 1990s, literally. It's the last time that we have made any major renovations to our immigration system. Because of the failure of leadership in building an immigration system that's responsive to you know, the modern economy that we have uh, today, a lot of the immigration that comes outside of the system is happening because our, our, our system has closed itself off to the realities of our time. We've never had immigration law built on economics. If you build it on, you deserve this. If people look and see someone here who's undocumented and here illegally, they think you don't deserve this. On the other hand, if we say the purpose of immigration is to build a stronger economy, a greater social fabric, that's a very different framing of the problem. I do believe that most Americans want to see that immigration reform. I think there's some out there on the fringe fueling this fear that immigrants are criminals, sucking off of our welfare system, and they are taking our jobs. Fact shows that's just not the case. The majority of Americans are people of goodwill. 
They may not be Democrats, they may not be Republicans, they are living in the literal and figurative middle of the country. So I'm optimistic that those Americans of goodwill will add their voices to the debate. It is a proud privilege to be a citizen of the great republic, to hear its song sung, to realize that we are the descendants of 40 million people who left other countries, other familiar scenes, to come here to the United States to build a new life, to make a new opportunity for themselves and their children. I think it is not a burden, but a privilege to make this really, as it was for them, a new world. That's what this country has stood for for 200 years, and that's what this country will continue to stand for. One inches of rain, 24 trillion gallons of water. Businesses were flooded. Thousands of homes were impacted. If you were from middle-income affluent areas, you flooded. If you were in low-income communities, you flooded. It was a phenomenal event. It's going to be the most expensive storm ever in American history. Houston has to return to some sense of normalcy after Hurricane Harvey. The goal was to get our kids back into school as quickly as possible. Transit system was back up a few days after the storm. Airport system was back up. The power was totally on. But at the same time, even though the city is quickly recovering, there are still thousands of people whose homes need to be repaired or rebuilt. Harvey can be characterized as the largest housing disaster in the history of the U.S. We think on the order of 300,000 homes impacted by Harvey. That's about half single family homes and about half apartments. Houston's success in the future depends on its ability to build a much more resilient city. How do we accommodate that reality as we go forward in the 21st century? Well, it's going to take three things. It's going to take, number one, uh, time. It's going to take money. And above all, it's going to take many additional workers. If you come at it from a point of economics and importance to the entire country, Houston and the surrounding area, the Port of Houston, represents probably 6% of the GDP in the country. When you look at the ship channel, we supply fuel to all parts of the United States. There are two international airports, the largest medical center, the largest children's hospital. There are not too many places that will have a greater impact on what happens in this country than right here in the city of Houston. One of the challenges we face is the storm has acted as an economic event all of its own. Not, not a good one, but one that's created a great deal of demand for labor. There's a lot of different kinds of work to be done. You can think of very highly skilled work on some of the facilities around town, water plants and those types of things. I think because Harvey was such a significant housing issue, the hundreds of thousands of houses that are damaged, that's the piece that I worry the most about. 
every able-bodied individual within the city of Houston and the surrounding region is called upon to do their work. As you can imagine, there's a, there's a huge need for contractors, and people will tell you it's kind of difficult to find those contractors these days. Our country, in particular our industry, are facing a workforce crisis. We, we have an exiting generation of boomers that with 10,000 a day are retiring, and we're seeing a big gap in the workforce. And the next significant number is millennials, and their expectations of jobs are a little bit different. A lot of the nonprofits have asked the question, uh, what are you doing recruiting-wise in, in the wake of the storm? And the answer is nothing new. I mean, there are no more new recruiting techniques. Those that are recruiting have been turning over every stone in an attempt to find qualified workers or candidates. Having this rebuilding effort go at a, the pace that we would like and, and having sufficient human resources out there to get that work done is a, is a piece of uncertainty right now that we just, we, we're not able to solve. Now my concern is clearly that it won't be sufficient and the clear result of it not being sufficient is people suffer for longer. One-third of all the residents of Harris County are foreign-born residents. 500,000 are undocumented immigrants. They are critical to the well-being of the city, to our ability to, to, to rebuild in the way that we need to, in the time frame that we have. And especially in construction industries, which are precisely the industries that undocumented or, or new immigrants who, who have difficulty with the language and knowledge about how to, how to do this building become the key forces in the construction industry that are going to be absolutely essential to Houston's ability to position itself for prosperity in the 21st century. We need to find a way to, to bring those people out of the shadows, to allow them to work and to pay taxes while they work on coming to, you know, to a position of legal status so that we can take advantage of that area of the workforce because when you try to recover from something like Harvey over a period of the next several years, that's an enormous surge in activity. As far as I'm concerned, we need all hands on deck What's the big solution? How, how do we blend together all these things? We have a fabric of laws, and I think we need to enforce the ones that we have. But I think the truth is that our immigration system does not work anymore. It does not address an economic solution, one that business can deal with. I need, as, as a representative of the city in this case, I need a legal way to be able to access that workforce. Not necessarily trying to convert those, you know, tens or hundreds of thousands of individuals to full-fledged legal citizens. But, you know, this idea of uh, can you get identification, can you be put into a special category, that would be amazing for us. Uh, we, would, we would love for that to happen. It is unfortunate that we're living at this point in time when people are fearful to participate in this economic engine that we call the city of Houston all of the private businesses that are in need of them. We need that labor force. In its absence, or the shortage thereof, it's gonna take longer, and everyone is gonna pay the price. As any other American city, we're gonna need immigrants to maintain our GDP, to maintain our workforce, and continue to have a good economy. Houston finds itself at the forefront of the transformations that are occurring across all of America. And it turns out it's the fourth largest city in America. It's the single most ethnically diverse major metropolitan area in the country, more diverse than, than, than New York, more representing uh, equal division among Asians, African Americans, Latinos, and Anglos. So Houston is one of the places where the American future is going to be worked out. Our ability to build and attract the desirable legal workforce is an economic and a value proposition, then I think that's something that everyone could learn from. I think it's missing from the message everywhere. We talk about right and wrong and left and right, and we never talk about value. And at the end of the day, anybody that should be here should be here in the country because they bring something to the fabric of our society. The fact of the matter is that everybody in this city, and I'm saying everybody, not just those with papers, contributes to the economic engine of this city and this region, which impacts the rest of this country.
you know, watching a city like this and how those very diverse populations now learn to live together and thrive together and maintain some unique character at all while being part of a bigger city. It is a fascinating experiment and one that the U.S. sure better get right. The reason why there's room for optimism about Houston is that Houston is good on the business case. It's able to add, to recognize the enlightened self-interest that is involved here. It's, it's business people recognizing this is in the long-term economic self-interest of the city as a whole. And that's where I think you're going to see that ability to transcend the anxieties, the fears that come with this remarkable demographic transition and say, yes, this is who we are. This is our destiny, whether we would have chosen it or not. We live in a pluralistic society. That's not going to change. Learn how to live next door with your neighbors. Recognize the strengths that people bring to the table. We are a welcoming city. We don't build walls, we build relationships. If you're within the city of Houston, whether you're documented or undocumented, regardless of your language, you are welcome in this city. Because the city of Houston is so diverse, and because we place so much emphasis, not just on being diverse, but being inclusive, the city is standing. Okay, uh, this one. Okay. Uh, so now we're gonna we're gonna kind of take some of the themes that you saw in the films and and discuss them in greater detail. And we've got uh, an esteemed panel here, uh, all of whom you just saw in in some of those videos. And uh, we're gonna we're gonna start working through some questions, and then we'll we'll also take some questions from the audience. But before we do that, I'm, I, what I'd like to do, Charles, is start with you and just have each of you uh, kind of introduce yourself, and and we'll just go down the go down the line. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, Lauren, I want to thank everyone, Stan, and everyone else involved with uh, Greg, uh, Rational Middle, and and uh, Center for Houston's Future, and Baker Institute for for putting this on. Uh, my name is Charles Foster. Yeah. Um, and I've. Uh, I uh, often say I practice immigration law now more than uh, more years than I'd like to admit. So I, I have focused on the day-to-day -day practice and dealing with people every single day, asking that basic question: uh, How can I immigrate legally? How can I get here and do it right? And I've also been very fortunate. I've been, I've also focused for uh, many years on policy. Uh, years ago, I, I served as a, a chairman of a statewide commission. Uh, uh, on uh, immigration for the state of Texas as it led up to the 1986 Act, and I served as a policy advisor. I like to say the senior and the junior policy advisor to then governor candidate and uh, future president George W. Bush on immigration because at one point I was his only policy advisor on that topic. <laughs> and I also worked for President Obama and I uh, worked for Republicans and Democrats alike. People get confused, how do you do that? And I always say, I'm trying to sell good policy, so whether it's a Democrat or a Republican, I'm glad to work with them. Thank you, Charles. I'm, I'm Steve Kleinberg, professor of sociology here at Rice, uh, uh, the founding director of the Kinder Institute for Urban Research. I realize I can be a founding director forever, right? Because uh, the Kinder Institute is just moving beautifully in a whole range of different directions of serving the city and more broadly understanding urban, urban life in America. And I've had this privilege of doing a survey for now 37 years that has tracked the remarkable transformations of Houston. And, and we'll come back to a lot of discussion, but no city has benefited more from immigration than Houston. We would have been a totally different place after the collapse of the oil boom when the Anglo population stopped growing and all the growth 
For the last 35 years, is this the most rapidly growing city in America? All the growth has been the influx of African Americans, Latinos, and Asians. And we've become, as we, as we now know, the, the single most ethnically diverse city in the country. And, and Houston's story is the immigrant story. And uh, I introduced myself earlier. I'm Tony Payan, director of the Mexico Center here at the Baker Institute at Rice University. Um, when I left uh, the PhD program at Georgetown University after I graduated, uh, I went to work at the University of Texas at El Paso. And even though uh, my PhD was in international relations, when you got to the when I got to the border, when you get to a place like that, you almost you absorb the place, you begin to become interested in what's going on. And so for the last uh, 18 years, since 2000, uh, when I left uh, Washington, D.C., I've been dedicated to studying uh, the U.S.-Mexico border, issues of immigration, drugs, flows, cross-border flows, legal and illegal. So I've been soaking in this uh, subject for 18 years now. Okay. Uh, Charles, I was hoping maybe you could start us off and with, with sort of a general assessment of where things stand in the immigration situation, but to, to kind of put a little focus on that, I wanted to pick up on something that Stan said in his remarks, uh, because he said you'd talk more about it, and that is uh, that there's a lot of people here who are undocumented who don't want to be. And Why is that? I, I think um, the, um, why, why is it? Uh, I often say that um, we Americans, our nat the native-born Americans among you in this room, we all know something about our, our health care system because we participate in it, social security, tax. We know a whole lot, but we don't know very much about our own immigration system because if you're a native-born American, you didn't ever have to worry about that. I, I always remember, I thought it was one of the most significant points ever made. I was talking to, at the point, at one point, to uh, President Bush's uh, head of uh, his domestic policy council, and she was frustrated. And she said, Charles, the greatest frustration is all those people in the room talking about immigration. None of them really know what they're talking about. And, it, and it's very hard when you think about that to put together the moving pieces. So. Um, the biggest thing I think that's missing uh, um, in the debate is that Americans just do not realize how extremely restrictive our, our legal immigration system is. Often you will hear people say regularly, those people uh, should uh, go back home, get in line, and come in legally. I mean, that makes sense, but that's like telling some guy without a job, you should just get in line and be admitted to Harvard Business School. No, Harvard accepts very few people and they have high standards and that's sort of our legal immigration system. So, you, uh, so unless you happen to have a close relative or job skills where there's a proven shortage of U.S. workers, uh, it's very difficult to legally immigrate. And to make it worse, uh, thanks to, uh, I often joke, uh, my friend Lamar Smith over in Cal uh, San Antonio. He, uh, a piece of legislation was enacted that says if you're here legally, illegally, you come in here legally, uh, you have to, before you, even if you're otherwise qualified, you have a, uh, with the passage of time, you've got a great case. You have to go home first and wait 10 years before you apply. Well, I've not had one person ever do that ever say, oh, that's a great idea, I can qualify, all I have to do is go home and wait 10 years. Nor have I had any employer ever say, oh, that's great, I'll sponsor that person and then 10 years from now they can come work for me. So our whole system uh, makes it virtually impossible for people that are here undocumented to ever qualify. So all the DACA beneficiaries you've heard about when they say go home and come in illegally, that's a total, uh, uh, that's a myth. 99% uh, will never be able to do that. Same thing with TPS uh, because of uh, the fact that our immigration system uh, is not, uh, uh, it is so restrictive. I could go on, but I'll stop. <laughs> Can I just add a quick sure, thought? Absolutely. I mean, that, that really is one of the most important things that Charles keeps reminding us of. There is no line. There is no way for someone to come here legally, uh, except by, by pure luck after 20 to 25 years, who, unless they have a, fa a family relative or special skills that are, that are in demand. The reason why we have so many illegal immigrants in this country is that for 30 years we have not allowed enough people to come here legally to do the jobs that we desperately needed to have done by people who desperately needed to do them. And it's that reality that has created this enormous army of folks who are, who are here because they want to work, because they want to make a difference, because, because they, 
they want to support their families and because the jobs are here waiting for them, needing them, and they can't get here legally. So it's a really remarkable kind of situation that we've created for before, ourselves. Before Tony speaks, there, there's another iron, uh, irony. We can talk about this more. Ironically, uh, the more in for, uh, since the uh, mid 70s, and, and I was on one of those voices there, I said this the more enforcement we've had since the mid 70s, there's a direct correla uh, correlation, the more illegal immigration. Because once upon a time, people sort of could come in casually, work, go home. I remember that. I grew up on the Mexican border. But as we hardened that border, at some point, uh, those workers said, I'll never do that again. That was so risky, so dangerous, so expensive to cross that border. So they wound up staying here and then smuggling in their family. Uh, at one point, they had just gone back and forth. So, uh, again, it's... it's um, uh, you wouldn't think about it, but the greater amount of enforcement created the greatest amount of illegal immigration. So, uh, Tony, what what do you see in your research? What is the most common misconception about about the immigration situation? I know Charles and Stephen have already kind of touched on this, but but what do you see as being the sort of the biggest misconception out there? That's a very good question. Uh, Back in 2014, uh, Bill Grubin, a colleague and friend, an economist from the Dallas Fed and I, uh, worked on a paper, and uh, the paper was titled, Is There Really an Immigration Crisis? And uh, I think I can still say with great certainty, almost four years after uh, we wrote that paper, there isn't an immigration crisis. There really isn't one. It is a manufactured crisis. Now, that's not to say there are no undocumented residents in the United States. That's not to say that people didn't come without papers and so on. But let me give you some numbers, and this is why I think the rational middle, and we need to pay attention to what we're doing. I'll just throw some, some numbers out there and show you why I don't think that there is today an immigration crisis. Uh, no, number one, almost every think tank, fact tank, uh, fact tank, any, any statistic that you can grab a hold of, will show you that the number of undocumented residents has actually been decreasing for 10 years, okay? It reached a peak of about 12.5 million undocumented residents in the United States in 2007. And for the last 10 years, by attrition, by people not coming, through enforcement on the border and so on, that number is now probably under 10 million. So at you know, yeah, there's still 300,000 people attempting to cross the border, perhaps succeed, come with uh, visas and overstay. But in the end, I think that the numbers are actually going down. And I think the labor market is beginning to show the strains of the fact that, that people are being taken off of the economy and the, and the labor market and being deported at a tune of some 1,000, 1,200 a day. That makes for 400,000 a year. So over two years, 800,000 over the last uh, uh, years of the Obama administration and now the Trump administration, you've taken literally millions of people off the 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 the, um, uh, the the undocumented population and also the documented population because people who got in trouble for driving drunk or whatever can also be deported their green cards can be taken away and so on so clearly I think that there is a, a big myth about that now uh, so we need the numbers. We need to understand where exactly we are. And I'm not an economist, I'm a political scientist, but here's a couple of things to think about as, I, as we try to sort out, n not from an ideological perspective, not from one side or the other, but just, just the numbers of how this thing is uh, working out. Think about this. What, is, what are the, the, the reasons why an economy actually grows? And almost any economist, will say population growth because when you add people to an economy these people become workers and consumers and they and the economy grows the more people the larger the economy that's one way an economy grows the other way the economy grows is productivity you know one thing is to sweep the floor with a broom and another thing is to uh, sweep a lot more surface of a floor with a an electric broom or, or some sort of machine. So that is productivity. The same working uh, uh, worker in one hour can sweep a, a larger surface. That's productivity, okay? That's technology, that's the way it works. Now, add to that the, uh, the, the fact that if you look at uh, the fertility rate in the United States, 
The European descendant population is probably at about 1.6, 1.7 children per woman. To replace that population, you need 2.1 children per woman. We are at 1.6. The African-American population is very stable. There's not going to be any more of them or any less. It's just going to be holding at a steady percentage in the country. The only two populations that are growing are Latinos, because they're at about 2.4 to 2.6 children per woman, number one. And number two, uh, Asians and mostly immigrants. They're not having as many children, but they're, you know, they're coming in larger and larger numbers. In fact, Asia may now be the largest source of immigrants to the United States. So now subtract to those numbers, those sheer growth numbers, the number of people that die in the country every year. I'm not sure what the, the morbidity rate is in the United States, but it's going to take some of that growth, immigrants plus births, off of the economy. And so what's the balance? The balance is that this country, even with immigration, even with, with that one million green cards that are being handed out every year, and even with the presence of the undocumented here, is barely holding. The population is barely holding. If we do a couple of things, which is expel 10 million people that live in this country without papers, because the president or Congress or whoever decides that they're going to go, and they're going to go, 10 million people, the population of the United States will be going down to 310 instead of 320. And then if you cut documented immigrants the way the administration wants to do it, from 1 million green cards to probably 400,000, 500,000, they said about 460% cut over 10 or 15 years. Well, you know that more than 400,000 people are going to die. And then the birth rate will keep collapsing because it is collapsing even among Hispanics. So clearly, we'll be a quickly aging country with great needs, an enormous population that needs new workers, young workers, productive workers, tax-paying workers. The, the policy, the immigration policy as it is conceived today is not economically wise. Just do your economics and your demographics and you realize that this policy is absurd and the United States will pay a very heavy price. One more th so, well, actually, I'll leave it there. Just, just to put some, some gross numbers out there, some, some numbers for you to understand that well, even if you take this presumed millions, a million green cards a year, 10 million present in this country, the reality is that the demographics and the economics are telling you that what is being proposed today, the massive expulsion of 10 million people and a dramatic reduction on the legal immigrants is going to create an enormous demographic crisis and it's actually going to make the U.S. economy shrink bit by bit. Charles, let's uh, let's focus that that issue of the democratic cri crisis a little bit on businesses and and what does this mean? I mean, how are businesses dealing with this crisis, and what are what are some of the biggest things that they're having to confront uh, in the current system? Well, um, as uh, Stan referred to earlier, it, it uh, there's a big impact on business at sort of both ends of the spectrum. Uh, you're not able to get enough uh, labor. Uh, there there are many uh, uh, areas including in construction and agriculture and hospitality industry where there are shortages. Uh, we're, we're at a uh, almost a record low unemployment, close to 4%. Economists will say that's close to zero unemployment. And you're not going, uh, you're not going to have a lot of people that have been displaced. Let's just say oil field workers that were displaced uh, during the, uh, when we laid off so many people. They're not necessarily going to go into agriculture or construction work. They're going to go look for something similar or open up their own companies. So, uh, and at the bottom of the um, food chain, there is simply no mechanism for those individuals to come in legally. It's not like uh, uh, people would prefer to walk across the Sonora Desert to get here as opposed to applying for a legal visa. You know, at the top of the food chain, that's also a real problem too because we have benefited tremendously by some of the most, uh, uh, by all the bright graduates and foreign nationals that come to the United States. Uh, I think the film uh, alluded to the fact that so many startup companies in Silicon Valley are started by immigrants. Um, it lasts, the last two years, 
all of the Nobel Prize winners in science uh, for the United States were immigrants uh, uh, in each of the last uh, two years. Um, we've got a crisis because historically, I remember in the, uh, I think it was the 2012 campaign, even Mitt Romney said we should staple a green card to the graduate, every graduate in the STEM fields. But today, right here at Rice University, uh, if you graduate and you're the brightest graduate uh, here in some field of science, you've got uh, the opportunity to stay in America. You may have a 25% chance. You could be the brightest student uh, because uh, historically you would go from, you would graduate, you'd get what we call practical training, and then you would qualify for the H-1B. And I could get into this, but there's simply, uh, th those numbers were reduced uh, I don't want, time doesn't permit why, from 195,000 to 65,000. Each year, employers will file to qualify graduates of our own university primarily uh, and others uh, more than 250,000 petitions, and yet there's only, for temporary work visas, only 65,000. So we're losing people uh, on both ends of the spectrum. It's so bad now that Canada is advertising in the United States saying, uh, establish your company in uh, Canada where you can hire the best and the brightest uh, because you cannot do that in the U.S. as much as you'd like to or need to. Yeah, again, just crazy. I mean, it's just so irrational and so counterproductive and so anti-self-interest in America. And it reminds us that so much of this is emotional. There's very little, to, and that's why the rational discussion is, is so important. And we were talking about this earlier, but, but you were saying, you know, this wave of immigrants is different from the past. Wave. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, well, you know, this is a fourth wave of immigration. Right? The first wave were, were the British and then we won our independence, and then came the Germans and the Irish, and I need not remind you what we thought of the Irish, right? And there's a wonderful, powerful statement by Benjamin Franklin talking about the Germans and how they were so alien and were never going to become like the Anglo-Saxons and were going to destroy our country. And then came the third great wave of 15.9 million immigrants coming here between 1890 and 1914, coming from Europe, but not coming from Northern Europe. They were coming from Southern East and Southern and Eastern Europe, and they weren't Protestants, they were Catholics and Jews, and they had no history of democracy. They come here to take our jobs and destroy our country. And then we passed this incredible act in 1924 to allow only Northern Europeans to come to this country. The law codified the Chinese Exclusion Act of, uh, in, in California of 1882, the Gentlemen's Agreement with Japan of 1906, to declare in the act Asians are an inferior subspecies of humanity, ineligible from ever becoming American citizens. Asians were banned entirely from coming to the country. This is the story of America. The story of America is in each generation, each new wave of immigration, Americans have felt that the last wave was great for this country, this wave is destroying America. And, and that has happened continually, and some of that is happening once again today, when suddenly we become a nation of immigrants again. And, and it, it is irrational, it has to do with, with the fears and anxieties, and it's particularly powerful today because we are in the midst, as, as we all know, of a, of a truly epic transition, right? The United States that had been an amalgam throughout all of its history of European nationalities is becoming a microcosm of the world. And it's a remarkable moment of tremendous promise, but also anxiety provoking. And you can see that happening. And so I think what we're saying so far on this panel is that rational, you know, self-interest leads to one set of, of conclusions and, and some historical sensitivity reinforces that sense that let's not make those same mistakes again. But the irrational fears of what's happening in my country, I want my country back, is, is a very powerful kind of emotion as well. We need to find ways to counteract that, to work through it. And then one other quick thing in our surveys that is so interesting is watching in every question that we ask. Uh, do, do you think the increasing ethnic diversity in Houston will eventually become a source of great strength for the city or a growing problem? Do the new immigrants into this country today mostly strengthen American culture or threaten American culture? All of those questions have shown significant, increasingly positive pro-immigrant uh, uh, perceptions as we've gone forward, as, Amer as Houston increasingly embraces its diversity and, and, and seizes a moment to build, build on this variety, the single most powerful predictor among Anglos of answers to those questions, comfort with diversity, support for immigration, single most powerful predictor is age. 
younger Anglos, just what's the big deal here? This is what I love about my country. And it's us old Anglos who are struggling to accept what younger Anglos take for granted. And, and, you can, and, and it's part of the, of the fact that we older Anglos grew up in the 1960s and 70s. That was a different world than the 1990s and 2000s. There's a law of human nature that says what I am familiar with feels right and natural, what I'm unfamiliar with feels unnatural and somehow not quite right. And you can see that pattern occur as we work through living at a time of truly revolutionary change. So it's not surprising that there's irrational fears and not surprising that older Anglos have more difficulty with this than young ones. I tell people, be, you gotta be gentle with us older Anglos. This is a big change in a very short amount of time. But you also have this deep sense of a movement in the, in the direction of increasing embrace and acceptance and, and indeed celebration of this new America. Well, let's talk a little bit about something that, that's happening more currently, and that's the, the DACA situation. And Tony, maybe you want to start us off. But, but this seems to be an issue that, that most Americans agree on, and yet it's become very contentious politically. We, we had a government shutdown. Uh, it was wrapped up in that. Uh, why is this such a difficult issue to, uh, to resolve? It seems well, like it would be a baby step towards a uh, larger reform. I think it's politics. Uh, politics is a contentious field. I think people get very emotional about it. They, uh, for some reason, it seems that they, they you know, they get blocked. Uh, we saw it with um, uh, some White House staffers when they said, "Well, they, you know, we have our facts. They have their facts." And it's sort of an interesting debate because the facts is a fact. Number two is a number two for the right, for the left. Top and bottom, it's a number two, and yet, you know, they they, they think that they have their own facts. Um, so, uh, in the case of DACA, to me, uh, uh, the um, Congress has been unable to to bring itself to think about these uh, million or so. Who knows how many they are, right? There's about 750,000 that are beneficiaries of this program. Um, some people say that 1 million qualify, 1.2 million, and I've seen the number of 1.8 million. The reality is that it's very difficult to know how many people actually qualify because because they live in, a lot of them live clandest in clandestine context. So it's very difficult to really know how many undocumented migrants. We have different methodologies to estimate, but we don't really know. So uh, in DACA, it's sort of an interesting uh, 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 test for this country because let's assume that you go to the Philippines and you pick up somebody who is uh, uh, of Tagalog uh, descent, the Filipino, right? And you and they speak Tagalog, and they have uh, maybe maybe know how to read or write. They're uh, uh, young, and then you pluck them out of the Philippines or out of Africa or out of Honduras, and you bring them to the United States. They got to learn the language. They got to get acculturated. They got to get socialized. They got to go through a whole uh, process of understanding the labor market, their place in society, how society works, how to participate, how to socialize with Americans. Americans. They got a huge learning curve, and yet. Here's a million people that were brought when they were one, two, three, four. They're American and they already speak English. Some of them I've met do not speak Spanish well or whatever language their parents speak. They already speak English. They already grew up here. They went to school here. They're more educated than the average American. They're going to school. They're, they're, they're doing all kinds of things. They're already acculturated. They're already socialized. They already live amongst us. They're already productive. They're already paying taxes. It's like, this is the kind of immigrant that we actually want, the one that you don't have to go through the whole ingredient mixing and preparing and the whole process. It's already mixed. It's already done. It's already acculturated and socialized. It's ready to go. It's an American that's already made up and ready to go, but they're missing the papers. And so to me, it, it is almost absurd that here we are rejecting a kind of population that is ready to go. Prêt à porter, as the French would say, ready to go. All you need to do is add water, and the guy is ready to go. He's an American. Uh, not, you know, it's a very difficult thing to understand that Congress cannot get itself to it. But I think there is one reason why, and I'll stop with this, because we haven't had a conversation about the role of immigration. Immigration creates such an incredible fear. Um, tribalism calls us and whether it's cultural or linguistic or national or whatever we begin to sort of feel afraid of the other we other the other the process of othering who are they are they a threat to us are they strange are they different back in the early 2000 
uh, 2000s, I guess 2005 or six. I was in El Paso. Uh, I was invited to a conference in Albuquerque, and I, I don't know why I was invited to the conference because it was about Guadalupeanism, Sufism, and some other and some and or or uh, some African religion. And so I was like, okay, why why am I being invited to this conference? So I talked about uh, Mexican immigrants at that time. It's ten years ago. And a lot of it was about values and about what values we hold and who we are. And, and then I began to sort of break down all the different stereotypes of immigrants and why immigrants uh, create such incredible sense of fear in us. And then I realized, my goodness, I mean, the image of the lazy uh, Mexican sitting under the cactus with a big sombrero taking a nap, which was quite a common stereotype in many in, in the iconography of this country. And then I look around and I see these guys working sun up to sun down so hard for so very little. I mean, I, you know, I hired a contractor to fix my house in El Paso and, you know, and the guy was so difficult and he put all kinds of requirements. It was so expensive. I called the, the, the Mexican guy and he came and he found a way to solve it and did it cheaply and so on. So I'm like, this is, this is a stereotype that doesn't work. So the point was, is who is creating these stereotypes? Who is stoking the fear? and who is going into our primal tribalistic sense and then pitting us against the other and who profits uh, from, from this kind of discourse. And I think that we have not given ourselves the time to think through the facts, to think through who these people are, their values, uh, the way they work, what they contribute and so on and sort of put all that behind and say, all right, let's be self-interested. What do they contribute? What do they pay? How much do they pay? How many jobs do they take? I mean, we can find the numbers, facts, real facts, not left, not right facts, facts, and then count them and then come up with reasonable solutions. And so, but transcending the discourse, the rhetoric, the fear is so difficult. But I'm afraid that in the United States, uh, this um, irrationality has actually sipped into so many of our public debates on welfare, on rights, on voting, on immigration. We do politics painfully and contentiously, and we do public policy that often doesn't satisfy anybody. And it seems to me that, you know, that, that this is, a, this is a, a kind of an irrational way in which we engage policy. And so for us to see that, break through that glass, that barrier of emotionalism, and just look at the numbers themselves, and we may just find the kind of the, the, the right solution. Well, Charles, what are some of the these economic impacts of, of immigration on things like uh, federal programs like Social Security or, or at the local level, health care and education? I mean, how do you how do we see the impacts there? Um. I was going to add something to what Tony just said, but I think I forgot. Uh, oh, yeah, on, on, uh, on DACA. I think I agree with everything that he said, and I'm going to answer your question. But uh, uh, again, I think the, um, the most difficult thing about passing it, actually, to his credit, President uh, Trump um, made a very generous proposal and the number of people that would be covered by essentially by chain, uh, moving up the date so more people could could qualify uh, but then uh, to get that uh, they added uh, too much uh, the democrats would have been willing to go along with uh, actually uh, supporting a, uh, a trust fund for 25 billion dollars to be used for uh, border enforcement so the president could say that he got the wall but as was alluded to earlier by Tony, they also wanted to decrease uh, legal immigration by about 50 percent, do away with the the um, uh, the diversity lottery, lottery program. But there there was a deal to be had. But in the end, I think really what happened, uh, the Democrats were willing to negotiate, and Republic there were Republicans too. Uh, but the White House, uh, I think the president was told that his base would never accept anything uh, because it would be called amnesty, and they refused to negotiate, and they said it was sort of a take-it-or-leave-it uh, uh, proposition. And, and yet, uh, there's a great deal of irony because, the, if, again, part of it is, again, what uh, Tony uh, and Steve have alluded to, just people being feeling uncomfortable about the cha uh, literally the changing face of America, but but their factual basis for opposing that is is uh, 
uh, Ted Cruz told me once that uh, rule of law, people violate the law, therefore they can't get a status. And I said, well, Ted, have you ever gotten a, a speeding ticket? And, and he said, yes. And I said, well, yes, well, then rule of law, you should be perpetually barred from ever driving. And he said, oh, no, that's, that's too much. And that was the point. You have to have balance. There is a middle ground uh, in terms of someone violates the law, you can come up with that. And the other point is, uh, people will say, uh, that uh, they should go back and come in legally. Of course, so there's a lot of just false narratives. Down to ask your to answer your question, Lauren, about the impact on on the economy. What was the question? About? Well, really, really <laughs> <laughs> we we hear a lot about the uh, you know the the immigrants come here, illegal undocumented immigrants come here, and they they they, they don't pay taxes. They're oh, not yeah. participating the in the system. And, yeah. yeah. Well, I, uh, there have been uh, one study after another shows that the economic impact of immigration, legal and illegal, is always positive. There was one, uh, there was one study. I can't remember the economist in, uh, in I think it was in Miami that said there was a slight negative impact on uh, un uh, on. Uh, African Americans uh, that had uh, in Miami area that had not graduated from high school. Excuse me. Yeah, um, but overall, uh, the the impact is very positive in terms of the use of social services. Uh, first of all, you, you have to start off remembering uh, uh, that immigrants are just like legal or uh, documented, documented or undocumented. They pay taxes for the most part here in the state of Texas, just like you and me. They pay taxes on their on their food, everything they buy, their cigarettes, their beer. Uh, they're paying. It. No one ever stops and say, "Oh, you don't have to pay this tax if you're undocumented." So they're 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 paying taxes to uh, indirectly real estate taxes if they whether they rent or not. So uh, first of all, there there is an impact under Plyard versus Doe. There is a constitutional right. Education is so fundamental that the uh, children, even undocumented children, can go to public school. So you could say uh, that is a cost, and yet their parents are paying taxes, when you think about it, to the state of Texas in the same proportion as their income, just like anybody else. So uh, uh, thanks to the state of, uh, the state of Texas, um, you, if you're undocumented, you can still go to a state university and pay in-state tuition. That was signed by, by Rick Perry and, and enacted almost unanimously by the state legislature. It's impossible to believe that the state legislature would, you couldn't get a single vote for that today almost, on the, at least on the Republican side, but it passed unanimously when Perry was, um, was uh, governor. I, I think on the... Um, uh, in the impact on our uh, health care system, uh, Stan alluded to that already. Uh, the, uh, in our, uh, uh, if you're undocumented, you're almost prohibited from buying insurance. Uh, you don't have coverage. You're working off the books. So, uh, so what happens is the worst of all worlds. They, go, uh, they will go in and use into the emergency rooms, but then typically they wait until they have emergency rather than getting preventive care. So there is a negative impact in that area as well. I want to say uh, I want to add something to to the to the issue of the political debate, and this is the whole point of this conversation. Um, I, I agree with uh, Charles. I think that Democrats made a mistake uh, in in Congress. I mean, President Trump offered a potential solution, uh, you know, but but they they bury their heels and do not move. And I mean, the, both parties do it, right? The, the, the Democrats said, well, you know, there cannot be any money for the wall. You know, we want to do this and that. And so they pile on the bill and then the Republicans at their own. And so as, as they add amendments and as they add wishes in, into the bill, they become to sort of drift apart. And in the end, there's complete gridlock. Um, it, you know, if I were a Democrat, I guess I would have said, look, give the president $25 billion. You got a million, you got two million. I think president said two million, maybe two and a half or something like that. He put it on the table. Two and, two, two and a half million people besides, I mean, including DACA. You know, give the president the, the, the border security. I mean, this is the price to pay. And then Democrats begin to kind of be afraid of going with it because they say, well, our base, 15, 20 percent is going to punish us in the next. And then the, the, the Republicans also bury their heels and then they say, absolutely not, because then our base 
is going to get really mad and they don't want any amnesty, any kind of thing. So they essentially kind of drift apart. But notice the elections last night. I mean, I saw what, two and a half million, maybe three million Texans participated in the elections. Who are voting in the primaries? Staunch registered Republicans and staunch registered Democrats. The 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 you know the, the very conservative Ted Cruz's and the very liberal Lupe Valdez's. That's who's in the in the game before the game before November. What about the rest of us? Did we show up at the polls? The ones that are looking for reasonable solutions. The other 15 million Texans that might be in the middle that might want some something sensible. No. So the game is played. No, the game is lost before the game is played. By the time we get to November, we got radicals. So the game is before, it's in, it's in March. It's sending people that, huh? in, the in the primaries, sending people that are sensible. Today, we lost the game. By now, it's too late. What are we gonna see in November in Washington? Bunch of radicals on both sides. That's what it is, because the middle stays out of the way. And the reality is that the solution is often in the middle. Well, I, you know, I mean, that's that's one of the things in our surveys is that there's the, the radical disjuncture between what people tell you when you ask them in the privacy of their homes, how do you see the world and what gets translated into into political action. And it's precisely through these kinds of distortions. On the other hand, there is an unmistakable movement in America toward acceptance and embrace of this. And the, the parts of the country that are, that are experiencing it the most are the most in favor of it. It's the rural areas with very little immigration that are the most opposed. And, it's, and the, it seems to me there's room for, for optimism and there's room for some sense of, wait a minute, who are we as Americans and what, what kind of an America do we want to have that may motivate more people to come out and vote this, this year than in past years. And there has been some increase in, in voter turnout. So, so there's, there's hope there, but it's, it, you know, it comes back to that famous statement from, from uh, uh, Edmund Burke, the great conservative philosopher who said, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good people to do nothing. And that, again, I think is a reminder of the, of the central challenge. And nowhere do you see that more clearly than, than DACA, coming back to that. DACA, these are kids, these kids did everything that we could have asked of them. They, fit, they went to high school, they went to college, they served in the military. They, they are 100% American kids, and we haven't been able to say, at least on that score, for God's sakes, let them stay in this country and don't send them back to wherever you, th you think they're supposed to go. I mean, it's, 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 it's a reminder of, the, of how irrational much of this is, and ultimately you have a sense rationality will out. We'll make it. So I think that's right. Well, that's a, that's a, a good break point for, uh, for to take some questions from the audience. Um, so we've got microphones here on either side. If you could come to the microphones, and we'll, we'll start working through. Yeah. Uh, thanks very much for this wonderful discussion and, and the wonderful film as well. I might ask a two-part question. It seems, and we've touched on a little bit of this, uh, on... First question, first part, uh, if you could snap your fingers tomorrow, you were in the White House, you were on Capitol Hill, and, and could come with a handful of basic fixes, there's a lot of talk about comprehensive reform, but some quick fixes or some top of the uh, list, what would you do? And then point, uh, part two would be, who are the real roadblocks, other than demagogue politicians that are sort of stoking this fear? We've touched on that. Who are the, if those are the solutions you've come to, who are the real enemies uh, to this reform, or is it just a waiting game that will get better over time, as you've mentioned? Thank you. I think, yeah, okay. All right, well, let, let me go uh, first. Uh, what to, actually, to answer your question, what, how to fix it is the easiest part. The, the, uh, the real only difficult part is the politics of it. You, I, I'm convinced uh, that you could sit down in a room if you took away the politics with Republicans, uh, Democrats, liberal and conservative, and come up with the solutions in about 20 minutes, and I, that may sound surprising, but everything that there is to know about this has already been figured out. But we can't get it over the finish line. So what to do on a policy? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Comprehensive has become a, a immigration reform has almost become a, a dirty word. 
but it makes sense. You have to have all the pieces together and you start with uh, like motherhood and apple pie with more barter enforcement. And under the 2013 immigration bill, even Cornyn said they threw a, an obscene amount of money toward barter enforcement just to say it. They didn't even have any idea how they could ever spend it. But uh, so w with that, uh, then you have to deal with the work site. People come here overwhelmingly for employment, for a better life. That's been the history of America. They come here for a better life to work. If they couldn't work, they wouldn't come. It's that simple. Uh, the 86 Act said that every employer had the obligation to verify, to, uh, to make sure that the new employee within 72 hours was work authorized. And I testified on this in 86. There were two big loopholes. Uh, that Stan knows about uh, the uh, the independent contractor exemption. So you look at uh, the housing industry; they don't have any employees. They're all in, they're all independent contractors, so they don't have to verify them. And the other one was, once the employer you had to verify who was authorized to work in America, that begged the question: how how can you tell? You can't tell them by their facial appearance or their accent. So the only uh, look at. Uh, uh, the first lady has an accent. So uh, look at the only way you could do that. The go-to document to determine that was a social security card. And I testified and I said there's only one problem with this. You can get a better uh, looking, a uh, better quality social security card in any flea market in America. So I and others advocated along with um, uh, then Senator Lloyd Benson, uh, that the uh, Social Security card should be upgraded, just like your passport, just like your driver's license have been upgraded in various ways over the years. You've all noted that. The Social Security card they're issued today is issued in the same format as it was in 1934, and the quality uh, in the flea market is much better and looks better and looks more realistic. So if you could fix it at the work site, uh, and that's better, by the way, than E-Verify, because E-Verify just says you that the person's elect, um, e -ver electronic verification. That just says that the person's name matches the Social Security number, but about 50% of the people are actually using a name that does match. Uh, they borrowed someone's Social Security number, so you wouldn't catch 50% of the people. If you could fix that, that would be a hundred times better than spending more money on a, a, big, a big wall, more effective. So that, that, that would be uh, an important part. And the other missing ingredient would be a, a, a viable uh, temporary workers program. Because I talk all the time to people who've entered uh, illegally. They come here initially just thinking they're going to work and go home, work and go home. And as I mentioned earlier, they just stay. So we need a viable uh, temporary workers program, which we do not have today that protects U.S. workers, so the employer is required to recruit at the prevailing wage to show they cannot find a qualified worker. And that works. Uh, I can give you examples in a limited uh, sense. And finally, the other big block of that is what do you do with whether it's 11 million or Tony, uh, it's probably, he's probably right, maybe it's closer to 10 million right now. You provide a, a, uh, a pathway to some legal s a status. Uh, Stan calls it tax and ID them. You give them an interim work status that's renewable um, and uh, you can put up a number of, of, of uh, requirements. They, they have to pay, uh, uh, they pay a fine because there was a technical violation of the law, although it's, it's rarely prosecuted. Uh, you say that in order to extend it any further, they have to meet certain other standards, standards like uh, English language or civics. And depending upon the bill, it may or may not lead down the road to lawful permanent residency. Uh, but all those details can be worked out. And the most uh, liberal advocate on this that I worked with is Luis Gutierrez of Chicago. He's a liberal Democrat, a great man, and he uh, he would he would take some any interim status because as he told me to stop the bleeding. So there's room for uh, you could sit you could be, uh, sit people down and figure all that out in 20 minutes and move one little piece around and move time up back and forth. But the politics makes it virtually impossible. So who are the the culprits. I, uh, one person I like to start with is Lou Dobbs. He used to give me cardiac arrest because everything on immigration, he was demagoguing. He made his career on uh, demagoguing uh, legal immigration and illegal immigration uh, in the most extreme uh, way. 
and, and, and the reason I had would have almost cardiac arrest was he was just blatantly uh, making false statements uh, day in, day out on national television. So talking heads on radio and television, they discovered from Lou Dobbs that this was a red meat issue and they've continued over a period of years demagoguing the issue, which in turn radicalizes the base and then uh, our elected officials that uh, rather than educating the base, they say they cannot, they're fearful of the base instead of challenging them. Uh, so I think the, uh, the, the other culprits are there are four organizations, FAIR, Numbers USA, and the Center for Immigrant Studies. They're all, they try to have a, like simi- I mean, a, 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 an appearance of legitimate organizations, but they're all controlled by the same person, set up by John Stanton. These are big anti-immigrant organizations. Um, that believe in zero immigration, and they have gotten, uh, uh, they've made enough progress that they're often cited by reputable sources as a legitimate source, not realizing it'd be like, you know, citing an affiliate of the Ku Klux Klan almost on race relations. Um, And so they are um, another big, uh, have become a big obstacle. And unfortunately, Without trying to be too political, President Trump probably instinctively, as in growing up in New York, was probably uh, he married two immigrants, so he uh, you know he's not anti-immigrant uh, per se. He also has immigrants living in the White House as in-laws, so uh, I, chain migration. You're right. So um, that's uh, uh, so he has been. Uh, I think he didn't know what he was doing. But he, he, he's appointed to key policy positions in all of the immigration agencies, people coming out of these three anti-immigrant groups. So we, it's the proverbial fox in the hen house running immig- uh, immigration. And one more thing, uh, in case I don't get to say, say it, the impact of the Trump administration on undocumented immigration has, for a variety of reasons we can get into, has been relatively uh, uh, not that big. The greatest impact has been on legal immigration. They've gone after legal immigration very aggressively, making everything, the, the limited number of ways you can qualify, but making it far more difficult, far more restrictive, uh, taking the position that immigration, I was listening to what Tony said, how we benefit from immigration, but the Trump administration, through these key policy people, see uh, immigration is a zero-sum game. Every immigrant must take away a job or hurt some Americans. Thank you. Over here. Um, I lived and worked in D.C. for 30 years in politics. And the first day I worked in the Senate, they told me not to bother with immigration because they don't vote until they're legal. And so no one cared. So how do you address that kind of an issue? unless you can make it personal. And I can tell you that standing up and talking about a business and saying I can't get workers, unless you tell me my strawberries are going to cost $10 or I want to remodel a bathroom and I can't afford it anymore because I have to pay a contractor three times as much and have to wait three more years. I don't see how you're going to ever, you know, jump that that chasm. But The other thing that I'd like to know is how many studies have been done on things like comparing and contrasting what happened with Uganda when Idi Amin pushed out all of the Indian workers and the economy collapsed for 30 years and only got back on its feet with a Goa when American money went in to prop it up. And what happened in Europe after World War II with all the Jews gone? Because it's follow the money. So what are you doing to show me this? I'll, I'll say something about the, the the more political issue. It's true that immigrants are not a, a, a constituency that is an, uh, empowered politically, obviously. You know, if you, if you have a green card, you cannot vote. If you're an undocumented, well, you don't even come close to, to anything like that. So, uh, but there are constituencies for uh, for immigration. I mean, the economy is the biggest and largest constituency, the labor markets, right? Uh, Silicon Valley, construction companies, uh, 
uh, the, uh, the the business community that benefits from from this uh, 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 labor. So I, I I think that there is a constituency out there, but. Well, I think that there hasn't been, uh, immigration is such a polarizing issue that there hasn't been a serious effort to draw the middle and then to kind of get people right there in the in the middle to, to understand it. I mean, obviously there are places like the Migration Policy Institute that are dedicated exclusively to that and they show the numbers over and over and over again, but the numbers don't don't seem to make it to the edges. They kind of stay in the middle and then the people controlling the, the debate are on the edges, but the constituencies are there. I think we need to make a much greater effort to say, kind of do the calculations that I try to make early, uh, kind of uh, on, on the back of an envelope uh, that I try to uh, to show you, is that that we need the immigrants. That immigrants are are actually, um, if we if we brought immigration down to zero, the economy would start to collapse very quickly. I mean they. First of all, if you subtract 10, 15 million people, you're already subtracting a, 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 um, a certain percentage of GDP or, or, or uh, annual growth. Uh, because as I explained, it's only people or productivity that make the economy growth. So immediately you take a, a certain percentage of the GDP and then you don't let anybody else in. And, uh, and and so you begin to, and the population is dying. I mean, look, we're, we're an aging country, we're dying. Uh, so clearly, if you can just show that and then create the constituency and bring them to the middle and not allow the, the people on the right and the left to totally, uh, to totally completely uh, uh, kidnap the, the debate. This is this is the greatest effort I think of this the rational middle and these efforts that we're the coalition that we're kind of creating around this issue that we have to show them with the numbers and eventually hopefully they'll make a difference. But again, the constituency that has an interest in immigration has to articulate its interests in advance, even of the primaries. You have to make sure that you get people to understand that because the way the political game is played now, only people who truly show the most radical stands make it to the to the um, November elections. And, you know, I think we're making yeah. a mistake there. Just following up on that in the second video, which we didn't see tonight, um, we had the number that, that if if all undocumented workers were were deported immediately, we'd, it would be about a 6% hit to our GDP, which would, would trigger a pretty good recession. So, um, and, and that was from... Houston uh, or Texas would be just decimated. Right. It's more. Right. Right. Yeah. And that was from um, that was from Douglas holtz Eaton, who was a former Congressional uh, Budget Office Director. So, yes, sir. Ben and Dr. Kleinberg both mentioned the other. And uh, there have been many studies to indicate that once you begin to separate people from, uh, it, it doesn't matter whether it's brown eyes versus blue eyes <coughs> or Americans versus the others. It's an irrational issue. I wonder, and specifically with DACA or the Dreamers, rather than calling them, because they're Americans. They're Americans without papers. And I wonder if using that phrase, instead of saying they're dreamers or they're people who are illegal, if we just use Americans without papers, whether that would help with the irrationality. <laughs> Except, of course, the problem is that they're not Americans and they want to become fully Americans. But but you're, it's a very good point. And that's, and it's a part of this, uh, you know, we, I, what we're waiting for is what we were saying earlier is, is it, it's not just the immigrants, it's all of us. It's what, what is our country? What are we about? What is, what, is, what is the meaning of America? What is our role on the planet as the first universal nation, right? The first nation that is a microcosm of all the world and all the world's peoples, all the world's ethnicities, all the world's religions. That's a part of what's happening across the planet. Houston, Houston and America are there first. And, 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 that, and, and the other thing that's important to realize is that we are falling in love with each other, marrying, having multiracial babies. We, said we, we sociologists don't like that. We want to put people into separate categories. But there, we are one third of all Anglos in this country have some close relative in their family who is not Anglo. 
And, and so there's a constituency out there that says, these are Americans and these are all people who belong here and are part of our, uh, of our, the fabric of our being. And can we mobilize that sufficiently to, to, to change the politics is a big part of the, of the, the there question. is a, there is a great, I think there is a great, we, I, at least we have to understand the politics of race in the United States. And I know that Germany has some of that and France has some of that. I mean, I, you know, I go in the summer, I go to Paris in the summers and I see the banlieues with the, you know, the Arabs and all that kind of segregated in the, in the, in the outskirts of the city and so on. So it's, it's almost everywhere. But I think one of the most powerful things that is kind of beginning to undo uh, this penchant, this obsession with classifying people is DNA testing. Uh, all of a sudden, millions of Americans are finding out that they're not that European or that they're 30% this and more Native American that and maybe a lot of Africa in the South, a lot of people are finding out that they got 8%, 60% African. So they're beginning to realize and so all of a sudden it's like the concept of race itself is being put back on the table by the very science of genetics. And I think all of us are beginning to understand, oh, we got some Native American, we got some European, we got some Arabic, we got, all of a sudden we're everything. And I think we ought to push that and to understand that. Now, one of the things that I said this morning in, in an interview, you know, um, it had to do with the, the fact that, and I think we should say it, the fact that the Trump administration has been very clear that there are desirable immigrants and undesirable immigrants. And the desirable immigrant to Mr. Trump is Norwegians. And the undesirables are Mexicans, right? So the question there is, or the, the, the way I see it is, Ms. Trump, there isn't a single European country that I know of that is massively expelling its population the way the Irish left Ireland and the Italians left Italy and the Greeks left Greece and the Spanish left Spain. I don't see of any. In fact, Europe is a dying continent. It is an aging continent. They're having a, a, a different kind of problem and they're having to attract desirable immigrants. So first they targeted Eastern Europe and they said, well, Eastern Europe's are, Europeans are better than Africans and Arabs. Well, Eastern Europe isn't expelling millions of people anymore. So for us on this side, all of a sudden it's like, okay, where are we gonna get the people? And I made a prediction because I travel into Mexico and I go over to Chiapas and, and I visit Guatemala and, and, and look at the border. I've done that several times. Erica De La Garza and I have gone there several times uh, just to look at that. And every morning at 6 in the morning, 6 a.m., you see a long line of young men, 17, 18, 20, 21, 22, 23, lined up for Mexican customs to open. And so I begin to sort of, you know, probe and, and ask questions. Who are these young men and what are they doing here? Well, they're getting a day work permit from the Mexican government to go work in the cocoa plantations, the sugar plantations, in Chiapas, in Tabasco, in Campeche. Guatemalans are coming into Mexico to do the work. There are entire communities of Salvadorans springing up in Saltillo and Coahuila. And there's all kind. So to me... And I see the, the, the demographic change in Mexico as well. And I realize that Mexico is now at about 2.1, 2.2 replacement level. So demographics in, in, in Mexico, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, the, the, the median Mexican was 19 years of age. Today, 30. In 20 years, 40. So clearly that's an aging country. And older people don't move. They don't move as much as, as, as younger people. And I said, I made a prediction, I may not be here to, to test it out, but I said in the future, Mexico will compete for Central American labor because Mexico will need that labor. So where is our labor gonna come from? It is going to come from India. It is going to come from China. It is going to come, and those countries may be so well off by then that they may not be expelling a lot of immigrants. So our conception that Norwegians are all of a sudden because they're being invited to come to the United States, they're about to jump on boats and come over is over. It's over. That's not going to happen. We have to look at global demographic trends and global economic trends. And I think it's an unrealistic way to build our own public policy on immigration. Over here. Excellent. I'd like to uh, thank you for your previous statement that reminded us all that we're all citizens of the world and all of our genetics are intermixed. And I'd like to thank Mr. Kallenberg and his team for their excellent video and you guys for being here. Um, 
So my topic is a little antagonistic. Uh, so looking back at the history of America and the waves of immigration as they've come in and they've undercut to certain people's viewpoints, uh, the workers that are already there. For instance, say Chicago at the turn of the 19th century, the Irish undercut by the Eastern Europeans, them undercut by native uh, African Americans moving north, that kind of thing. And everyone viewing the others as a different tribe and fearing their presence. How do you stop people fearing the other? What do we? What do you say? You know, it's a classic question. Right. How how rational is the fear that the jobs are going to be lost or the immigrants are going to take the job? Uh, we need an economist, I guess. But, but I'll turn to you, Charles. Just like the. Uh, it turns out, if, if all, as my understanding is, the studies don't show that that much. That Latinos say coming here don't speak English, and so they do the jobs for which you don't need English fluency. And the Americans, you said those jobs go to other jobs that are that often pay better. The most and and all the every city that is thriving in America is thriving because large numbers of immigrants have come. The cities that are that are having the greatest difficulty. My favorite city next to Houston, which is Philadelphia, where I just spent many years of my life. Philadelphia is just is having a tremendous problem because for one reason or another, it never became a magnet for the new immigration that has transformed cities like Houston and Los Angeles and New York and Chicago. And so it's all the evidence that I have seen suggests, as, as Tony was saying also, that immigrants are a clear, un unmistakable net positive, at least in the longer run. There's the short run uh, issues, that, but it's, it's a part of the zero-sum game th thinking that just doesn't make sense in the dynamic world that we live in. I just want to say one sentence. Uh, I don't want to monopolize the conversation, but I think it's important to say, because you said, well, who's threatening my job? Look, we have to understand that our job is being threatened by robots today. It's not immigrants. It's technology. All of a sudden, you know, there's going to be, there was an interesting article in the New York Times this morning saying, oh, bricklayers you know, are saying, there was an I, I, I didn't read the whole thing, but it was like bricklayers are saying, at least our jobs are safe. And then all of a sudden somebody shows them a robot laying the bricks one after another. <laughs> and then, all, you know, yeah. so clearly I think we're going to, this is going to create a crisis of, you know, what kind of society we're going to live in and what kind of jobs we're going to have. I get mm -hmm. a little bit against yeah. you there for earlier, you were talking about the two um, parts that go into the equation for growth and there was productivity increases yeah. or net population growth. Well, you're discussing productivity increases here, so you get rid of the need for product or population growth, to right? To some degree. Does that undercut your argument? That's I don't know. To me, <laughs> the way I understood your argument, it kind of does. No, I mean, obviously a robot is more productive for a number of reasons. It, it works. It works 20... 24 hours a day, you don't have to, you know, it doesn't need maintenance, it doesn't need love, it doesn't need attention, it no doesn't, you know, no coffee breaks, nothing, okay, obviously, so that's going to be, but what I was, what I was trying to say is, we're going to have to, but then, who's, who's appropriating the, the, the value that that robot is creating, right? So, that is going to create a very <coughs> serious crisis about, what wealth is and how wealth is distributed if in the future we're just going to have a bunch of robots creating a lot of wealth and where is that wealth going to go? Who owns that wealth? It, those are very kind of, yeah, they're political science, they're legal and they're sociological questions, but I think they're also philosophical questions. You know, what kind of society are we going to live in? Over here. Okay. Okay. Um, one of the things I think that has always really uh, amazed me as an immigrant is that people coming to this country, they come here obviously to work uh, for economic betterment, but um, they come here because they believe in core American values. What are these values? Okay, we murdered all the Indians, we, we lynched all the all the... The, the blacks, we drove the Mexicans off their land and took their land. Uh, you know, Sam Houston came here as an illegal alien, if, if you all really want to know the truth. But the point is, we keep coming. Even though we pass, this country passes laws to exclude Asians, to punish people that are not Anglos, yet we keep coming. We keep, and why do we keep coming? Because there is, there, Dr. Kleinberg, you, you've done a lot of, of study of this. There is a belief that, sure, we the American people did all these horrible things on this continent, but yet 
Why do we come? We believe that that there are values that we want that that we that we want to take advantage of. But why is it up to me to tell Americans what their values are or what they should be? You see, I mean, please comment on that. Oh, you bet. <laughs> Uh, one, one, of, one of the questions we ask every other year in our surveys that the Greater Houston Partnership calls me every year and says, how's our question doing? Question that said, do you agree or disagree with this statement? If you work hard in this city, eventually you will succeed. And Houstonians believe that more than people in New York and Los Angeles, and it's the can-do spirit and proof that, America, that Houston is the group, of course, that believes that the most are Latino immigrants. If you work hard in this city, eventually you will succeed. And that... American faith, that replenishment of the American spirit is happening with this group of them, just as it was happening when the Italians and the Greeks and the Poles came a hundred years ago. And it's that reaffirmation of what we believe in as Americans and who we are and what we want to be. So thank you. Uh, I think that in addition to the construction crisis that we heard a lot about, we're sitting across the street from the largest medical center in the country, perhaps the world, and the average uh, age of a nurse at the bedside is approaching 50 years old, and they're leaving uh, the bedside at an enormous rate, and our nursing uh, programs in the United States can't turn out graduates fast enough. At the same time, 10,000 people a day are turning 65 years and older and starting to use healthcare at a, lar at a higher rate than perhaps earlier in their life, we will no longer have the workforce to staff our hospitals. And the programs, the H-1B visas and all those things that we used to rely on in healthcare, those numbers are shrinking as well. And so uh, when you, you know, showed the video of Houston, showed Texas Children's and the medical center, there will be no staff to uh, keep those hospitals open. And so, you know, I, I wonder, you know, how we can, you know, maybe we need another video <laughs> about healthcare, but I wonder, it, it's, it seems like, you know, we're, we're working against our own self-interest. Yeah. I'll, I'll take that since we represent a lot of institutions in the medical center. Uh, this gets back to, we have a highly restrictive uh, legal immigration system. The H-1B numbers are inadequate. Further, we do a lot of work with healthcare professionals. Uh, with the passage of time, it's much harder to qualify a, a, a nurse down for H-1B. The, the, the one good, ex there is an exemption for non, uh, for uh, institutions of higher education, so they're not subject to the cap. But I often joke, there's only two professions that are excluded from the United States, prostitute and doctors. Uh, and uh, you, if you have a, uh, if you're a, uh, an individual uh, uh, trained in all these brilliant uh, uh, students come here, they're accepted in our residency program, and I would get these calls all the time from DeBakey uh, De and others saying, we got to keep this guy, and, and, uh, but by law, you have to send him back home. You've got to go back home. There are some very narrow exceptions. So. Again, there's uh, the legal immigration system doesn't match up to uh, the, the the economic needs broadly, and certainly not in healthcare. So, what do we need? We need broad-based, comprehensive immigration reform. And I want to just pick up on on that uh, the remarkable reality of the baby boom generation, overwhelmingly Anglo babies born between 1946 and 1964. The leading edge turns 72 this year. There will be a literal doubling of people over the age of 65 in the next 25 years. And the key point that every day between now and 2030, 10,000 Americans day after day will turn 65. And by 2030, the youngest of the 76 million will turn 65, heading eventually, not right away, but eventually off into the sunset, being replaced by a very different generation of Americans. And it's very much what Tony was saying, too, that this is our future. This is, this is who we will be. Uh, and it's a part of this epic transition that not everybody is entirely comfortable with and that underlies some of that irrationality. But there it is, and it can be the greatest asset that, is, that Houston or, or America could have. In terms of Over here. Yeah, uh, my name's Neil Hurley, an immigrant to Houston of uh, four years. And uh, I just wanted to say something on a positive note. I really appreciated uh, Gregory and all the folks involved, the video. I'm not a very emotional person, but it drew a few tears, you know, just uh, watching those uh, videos. One of the comments that Gregory made was, hopefully this will get out to middle America 
and the smaller towns in America. And I just wanted to offer a perspective that maybe most people in this room don't have. I spent many years living in Wisconsin and Michigan, you know, two kind of farm rural states. The people are very good there. Unfortunately, they helped throw the election uh, this last time. But um, just a comment, the very best Mexican restaurants and markets that we've ever been to have been in Wisconsin, not in Houston or not in Texas. <laughs> And I think that's partly because of all... I have to push back on that. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's the farm workers and the people up there. And the locals embrace that culture in my experience. So with Gregory's comment of hoping to get out to middle America and the smaller towns, I'm encouraged. I think the chances are good. And I really appreciate um, these videos. And I hope they can get out there and have the hope for impact. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. OK, we'll, we'll, tr we'll try to do the, the three questions that we have left, but uh, we, we're running short on time. So if we can if we can work through them pretty quickly. Yeah, over here. Okay, thank you very much. I, I think you know you presented a tremendous number of facts. And I, I, I thoroughly believe, I think many people believe, we're headed toward a crisis. Also, believe very much in the primaries, the, the, the people that, that are elected in the short term are the, the two ends. And there has to be a crisis to give them political cover to act to satisfy their base. But I think we're all headed toward one. But do you see a way to coalesce what I'll say almost a crisis before it gets to be a catastrophe so we can act on this? Uh, interestingly, uh, President Trump created sort of a crisis when he rescinded the DACA program. And so we had that March 5th deadline. And that was sort of, um, I was sort of sorry on one hand that DACA was rescinded. I was very sorry DACA was rescinded. Uh, but it was, I, I was excited that, that that deadline created the crisis that you're talking about. There was a big push. Everyone said, we've got to do something. We've got to do something by March 5th. But two things happened along the way. One, uh, two different uh, district courts found that the action of uh, President Trump, they enjoined the action of President Trump. So in fact, the program did not expire on March 5th. And so Congress never acts unless they have a deadline. So that sort of gave everyone sort of an excuse. And finally, because in the end, the White House, when I say the White House, uh, Steve Miller uh, was, was pushing back on the president and there was never going to be a deal that he could accept because the base would not accept anything, no matter even, uh, by the way, Schumer would have gone, the Democrats ultimately would have gone along with the $25 million funding for the wall. But uh, they were never. Uh, but the White House was never going to accept any deal, and they were actively. Um, there, there was a deal to be had that included most of the points of the president, but the uh, White House was actively uh, against it. What other crisis? I'm not certain what it would be. I was hoping that DACA would, a passage of a DREAM Act would be a down payment and Republican could see that they survived that, that they didn't get thrown out, and we could move on to bigger reform. Over. Uh, two comments. Thank you. It's a very, very good presentation. Um, there are two things I guess I want to make a comment on very briefly. One, there are two Americas. There's the America. I'm a multi-country immigrant, actually, and an immigrant back to this country again. The America that we all grew up with, that most Americans have forgotten, is that land of opportunity, that land that has all these ideals that you see in the Statue of Liberty and the Constitution, that most people view as not the poetic America. It's the real America that gives them aspirations to move. It's the highest challenge for them to get off their butts and move and leave war, disaster, famine, all these things that have happened for any opportunity. And the second part of that is that for all the things that have happened and all the bad things that we've done as a country, um, this is still the greatest land for opportunity on the planet, bar none, as a person who came here once again back penniless, starting over again from nothing. And the third part of it is that you guys are pressing the American people, and the people who actually need the immigrants are the business community, the farm communities, all these people who have to have these very serious inclusions of numerous talented, aggressive, innovative, aspirating people who have initiative. And those are the people who have to see this pitch. The American people aren't going to move. Business is losing money when they don't have this. 
whether it's Silicon Valley, whether it's manufacturing, whether it's plumbing, whether it's welders, those are the guys who need that new blood and that opportunity. And that strikes me as the key difference between what you're presenting and what I think probably should be presented. And I thank you. And that's it. Okay. I, because I'm just very brief. The business community has been very pro-immigration reform. The Greater Houston Partnership, the American Chambers, just about every trade organization has been very, very pro. But it doesn't, in the end, uh, it, it has not been very effective. I was working for President Bush uh, when we were, we were trying to pass a big immigration bill in 2006 and seven, and he was, he, he was actually uh, very angry. He didn't think that the business community was effective enough, but in principle, they're very pro-immigration reform. Yeah, I want to. I, I want to say something about that. That uh, what you what you said, and without you know dissertating about what are the motives uh, that Americans have when they act. There's generally two that I see in history, and I may be corrected by political thinkers, but you know one of them is the the moral, the right thing to do. And Americans always have this in the ear. You know, there's somebody whispering in their ear, what is the right thing to do? What is the moral thing to do? We asked that question uh, in the Civil War. We asked that question in the in the two world wars. We asked that question all over throughout history with the civil rights movement and so on and so on. So we, we've always kind of have that question. And the other one, the, uh, the other little, I don't know if it's the devil or the angel that whispers at our ear on the other side, is self-interest. It has to work for me, it has to pay off, it has to give me something in exchange, and we sort of debate between these two different things. I think both are being tested today in this immigration debate. Our ability to understand the moral thing and create public policy that that is the right thing to do is being tested because we are demonizing immigrants because we are, uh, 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 for example, the, the reducing the number of refugees. I think it's part of doing the right thing. Some, pe some of these people do need a place to be safe from war and famine and so on. It, it's testing our ability to say, yeah, we can get 50,000, 60,000, 70,000 people here that really need it, that really need to escape their hell and we can do it and we can provide for it that is the right thing to do and interestingly enough what I've seen in the last few political contests is also that our own ability to look carefully and consider our self-interest is also being tested because we don't want to pay attention to the facts we don't want to pay attention to the statistics the demographics the economics the fact that we're going to be creating a crisis that we're going to be shrinking our our economy that we're going to be we we don't we don't see that so something is happening in the country today that is putting these two tracks that generally are good, genuine debates in this country, and they're being tested. We're being tested by alternative facts. We, we're being tested by, I don't care what you, you know, what the facts are, I think what I think, and that's it. I'm irrational. And we're also being tested on our morality, our mission as a country that has always tried, whatever our sins may be, right? Discrimination, racism, uh, 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 whatever, the, you know, all the things that you mentioned, uh, still we debate them. Even, even if it's just in the academic world, we debate them, right? And so right now we're being tested. And I think immigration has brought that to a pinnacle. And it's testing our ability to understand why it is in our self-interest to legalize DACA recipients and why it is the moral thing to do. And we haven't found that middle. We just, you know, this is what we keep debating over and over. But, but the reason I, for, I some, a, for some optimism, just very quickly, is, is that what you've shown is that both of these come together, right? It, it, what, what is the moral thing to do is also the self-interested thing to do and vice versa. So again, there's some sense of opportunity here as, as people come to better understand the, 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 what's at stake in, in this discussion. I just have a simple nice question. a simple question to end on because there's a factor in this immigration that hardly ever gets talked about. How large is the issue of people that come into this country through airports, whatever, with visas and they overstay their visas and they're part of the 10 million people? And what are we doing about them? Because we're talking a lot about uh, Hispanic immigrants 
and all those issues. And I've heard two wonderful speeches here by Mr. Merrick years ago, about, and I heard uh, Representative Gutierrez talk in that room over there that was fabulous. But we never hear anybody talk about the issue of people that violate the visas and what are we doing about that? And that's a significant part of this problem, I think. Yes. So, so if you look at the, the given numbers, and these are uh, rough guesstimates, if you look at whether it's 11 or 10 million dollars, 11 or 10 million people in undocumented status, roughly 40% are, are estimated to have come into the U.S. legally, admitted as a visitor uh, for business or for as a tourist or maybe as a student, and they just wind up staying, overstaying their allotted period of time, and sometimes they wind up staying for, for, a, uh, for a generation. And so what to do about that is, is very difficult because uh, I don't, uh, I, I read these figures all the time, but given all of our ports of entry, our land ports, our airports, our seaport, there are several million people a day that are being admitted to the United States coming and going. And there's no way that if, that if uh, some person overstays that we can have someone looking after those millions of people as they change hotel rooms or move about the country. So one of the uh, proposals, of course, would be to um, enhance internal security. China has done that, and I, but I don't think America is ready to do that. When you come into China, your, uh, your photograph, they have facial recognition, and they have on virtually every corner, they have cameras that they can pick you out. But I don't think we'll go for that uh, in the United States. I think in the end, to stop people uh, from staying here, the best solution, they wouldn't stay here if they couldn't work. So uh, uh, focusing on, at the job site, uh, enhancing the documents that have to be shown uh, through employment verification and limiting the, uh, the independent contractor loophole would be the, the, the best, most effective way to deal with that too. All right, we're going to have to leave it there, but I want to thank everybody for coming. I want to uh, once again leave you with three thoughts. If you liked what you saw tonight, um, please go to rationalmiddle.com, download the videos, share the videos. Uh, if you would like us to, to do a similar presentation for your group or in your community, reach out to us. We're happy to do that. And, and finally, if you or uh, yourself or if you know someone who's willing to fund the videos, uh, please let us know because we'd love to make more of them. So uh, I'd like to thank our panelists uh, for being here, and let's give them all a round of applause. Just on behalf of the uh, Center for Houston's Future, I want to thank uh, the Baker Institute and Tony and his staff for putting on a marvelous presentation. It's really been a great discussion. We need to bottle this and take this to D.C. So thank you all for your attention.